Career Musician Podcast with creator and host, Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes, and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. Mr. Derek Jones from Megatrax. Now, if you haven't heard, Megatrax is a production music library based out here in Los Angeles, California. If you're not familiar with production music libraries, then Google it because you should be as a career musician. And if you're not a career musician and you're just listening for fun, well, basically, a production music library provides catalogs in large volume of what we call underscore or music cues. And now this is the music that oftentimes you hear under the dialogue in some of your favorite movies and TV shows. Well, Megatrax literally is mega. They are a ginormous company and they have thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different cues and songs and so forth by a plethora of of composers and artists. Now, Derek Jones is the man behind the curtain. He runs their multi-million dollar studio facility and is in charge of quite a number of the productions that Megatrax puts out. I will let Derek tell you himself, trust me, this man is extremely knowledgeable with a vast skill set that runs the gamut from production, composing, mixing, engineering, and so forth. Check it out right here on the career musician podcast so welcome to the career musician thank you and you are by title engineer producer xyz what else how do you describe yourself um my official job title is director of creative services and production slash um chief engineer slash producer now that uh, is impressive. Yeah, I got slashes, but uh, <laughs> I love I'm a slashy. <laughs> I love <it. laughs> but, okay, uh, that's funny. I could uh, it, What ended up happening just through time, uh, being at the same studio, um, I've kind of assimilated jobs or positions into my position. Mm. And so, but they're different enough that the title came with it. Um, mm-hmm. So... You know, I, I was uh, an assistant engineer and then graduated to like first engineer, or second engineer, first engineer, and then the chief engineer of the studio retired. And so I kind of just became chief engineer. But in addition to doing all of that, I started to create um, a catalog for the company that I work for. And um, I started to do all that sort of stuff. So that's where the producer comes in. But then I also kind of oversee and wrangle all the cats for mm. the owners of the company for their albums that they do. So that's where the the director of production and creative services, because I, I also do, like, I'm, I also oversee custom stuff when custom stuff comes in, so. Right. And you've asked me, you've spearheaded a couple of projects that I've done, but you yeah, actually absolutely. approached me. Yeah. Are we allowed to divulge the name of the company you work with? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, we can. Okay. So, it, uh, so it's a company called Megatrax Production Music, and right. uh, we we make music for licensing in TV and film. Um so we don't score like a lot of musicians are like, Oh, so you score films or you score. And it's, we don't score. What we do is we record the music ahead of time 
in hopes that somebody will have a use for it later. So if you if you think like um, John Williams writes the score to a movie, but in one scene the actors go into a nightclub, they're not going to have John Williams try to write EDM music, you know. Um, and oh, so yeah. we have yeah. albums of EDM music. We literally sure. do every style of music. Um, That's right, you do. It's it's crazy. It's we, we uh, just did a, a hybrid flamenco project yep. together. Yeah. Yep. So, and, I mean, uh, and that's just one out of, yeah. like you said, hundreds of genres. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the reasons why I like working there. When I first moved out to L.A., I was looking at different studios to work at. Well, originally when I moved out to here to L.A., I was trying to be a uh, like a touring musician. Uh, I'm a drummer, actually. Okay, that was um, one of my questions. Yeah. What's your principal? Okay. And um, it's just funny how life kind of keeps coming back around and smacking you in the face. So, Isn't it, though? Since high school, I've always being the drummer you have to get the microphones to record your drums when you're in the band and um <laughs> you know the singer just shows up with the one microphone and the guitarist will either plug in direct through their <laughs> little you know whatever boss pedal they have or whatever Box, yeah. you know um this is back when like Tascam porta studios on you know cassette four tracks were I have one thing. in the garage <laughs> amazing <laughs> yeah. and uh you know we were all recording little demos to in sure. high school to get gigs and uh so I ended up having to learn how to record my drums, and I was blessed to go to a, an amazing high school, a public high school in Massachusetts, that had a phenomenal music program. We had um, a music wing of the high school, um, and the band room was big enough to... F it, the band room was so big that we had our marching band drum line set up all the time, and then we had our entire orchestra set up, and then we had our entire jazz big band set up in an arc around, because wow. it was set up like, um, it was set up, you know, um, like a orchestra style where it kind of arcs around the room. It's incredible. And there where the was tears. this? It was a little tiny town called Linfield, Massachusetts. Okay, so um, we It's about, about 20 this. minutes north of Boston. But um, a lot of sports players live there. Like a lot of the Boston Red Sox live there. A lot yeah. of the Boston Bruins live there. Wow. Um, and so the town has a lot of money. Um, That's but cool. in the 60s, they built a new high school and the music program was always really strong there. And they decided to spend in, this is like in 1965 or 68, I think they spent something like uh, 250 or $350,000 building the band room. It's all acoustically designed. Um, it had acoustic panels on the wall. It had these huge eight foot diameter convex sound clouds that hung at different levels. The It basically was like a second gymnasium. So imagine wow. uh, a high school gym, but converted into a music room. A so studio. the floor had these uh the the bit the floor was like a normal floor but then halfway there were these concrete risers that they built into the floor so you had like instead of having wooden wow. risers that you set up on you know yeah. so that the the percussion is up at the back and sure. uh these were like they framed it and poured the concrete, concrete. and built these concrete <laughs> tiers that were about uh, four or five feet deep and they arced around the entire one side of the one half of the room so they built staging into the room basically yeah i mean it's it, got, it has it was, its own stage it was pretty amazing yeah. and then we had like a, a wing uh that the band room was attached to where we had our own classrooms we had our own lockers for our instruments um practice rooms we had like four practice rooms with pianos in them and stuff it was like a kind of reminded me of like a little mini berkeley um that's cool but uh the, good it memory, was phenomenal by the way, to, to, to recall all this with such detail oh dude i spent i spent most of my high school in there we like there. um it, we could get a pass from the um the music teacher if we had study hall we could go to the band room mm. and then we would just practice so i started to record demos i asked yeah. the band director if i could because it just sounded amazing in there i mean it was all acoustically tuned and everything it was phenomenal and so i brought my drums into the high school and set up the four track and started recording my drum set in the big band room during like study hall and stuff like that. And then I started wow. experiment. Uh, I started experiment moving mics around and then I started moving my drum set around and um, I just started getting into sound and you know how sound works. Sure. Um, just, so your brain was already on this yeah. engineer tip. 
yeah. well before you might have even been aware of it. It just kind of yeah. happened intuitively. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so it kept coming back. It was like a reoccurring theme. You know, mm. I would give somebody a, a tape, be like, hey, man, check out my playing. You know, I'd, yeah. I'd love to work for you. I'd love to work with you and be yeah. in your band. You know, like when I'm trying to like, you know. Uh, between high school and college and trying to, you know, get gigs in college. They were like, yeah, yeah drumming's pretty good. But man, who recorded that? It's phenomenal. I'm, I need to record. And I'm like, yeah, I did. But, you know, I really want to really play the play. drummer. Well, I already have a drummer, but, you know, I, I need somebody to record. And it's like, uh, okay, I guess I could record. Um, so, uh, you know, I had to record a, a scholarship tape uh, to get a scholarship to go to Berkeley. And, um, and you know, the everybody, even halfway through, going to Berkeley, people, teachers and things like that, when I was taking mp &E classes, they would listen to this and be like, who recorded this? And I'm like, I did. Wow. They're like, what console did you record through? None. It was just it was straight, <laughs> straight into the task cam. And like, it sounds phenomenal. Like, you know, and, and no EQ, no nothing. And it, it really kind of taught me from an early age that, you know, acoustics kind of trumps everything else like we can mm -hmm. i mean i love gear and i'm not knocking any gear but right. you know there's the right tool for every job but um if if it's crap in you're just polishing turds so um you know getting it to sound right before it hits the microphone and when it hits the microphone is kind of the most important thing but anyway so just um you know i started off as a performance major in college and then halfway through i wanted to switch to um mp and e MP &E. which is music production and engineering. Thank you. And um, I went to the dean and, of that department, and he was like, yeah, I would love to have you. Your grades are great. It's a solid three years of classes for this major. And I was talking to him in my like fifth semester, I think. This so, is at Berkeley. At Berkeley. So I would have been at Berkeley for six years. And I was like, there is no way I am going to college for six years. So um, mm -hmm. he recommended I do this thing called professional music, which is technically what I got my major in. <clears throat> and uh, professional music, I believe they still have it at the school, but it was kind of like a choose your own major. You got to basically pick and choose. You, you sat down with the department head and you said, this is ultimately what I want to do mm -hmm. in the music business mm -hmm. or in the music industry, uh, whatever it is, you know, it could be anything. Um, and then you and the head of the department come up with your own curriculum based on that. And it, the department head, uh, the guy's name at the time, I believe was Ken Brass. He would talk to the other department heads and get you waivers, uh, so that you wouldn't have to meet all the prerequisites to take certain classes that you might need. Nice. So I was able to take, I mean, I didn't get to do the full mp &E program, but I got to take some music production and engineering classes. I got to take music business classes. I got to take arranging, uh, and orchestration classes, um, you know, I got to kind of take a gamut. My goal was I, you know, engineering was a thing that like I did, but it wasn't like the thing I wanted to do. I really wanted mm. to be a producer. Um, and uh, I just, I always liked the idea that, you know, uh, especially when you're a musician, you're always kind of going around trying to find somebody that needs work and I, I needs you to work needs for them. To work. And yes. I, I always wanted to be the guy that created the work Thank and then you. could hire other people to do it. Okay, and hold on. I got to interject because one of the one of the discussion topics is words of wisdom. Listen, everybody out there, that's a gem right there. <laughs> if you're sitting here saying to yourself, oh my gosh, if I can only get a gig, I need more work. Well... That is it. You have to be in a position to create the work. Yeah. And that's that was very insightful of you. Yeah. So this is in college. Yep. So at a young age, you you know were privy to this. Yeah, I noticed it. You know, yeah. you could see it. Um, everybody runs into it and they see it. Mm -hmm. And you know, some guys go the route. Well, I want to start my own band because that's mm -hmm. the way I can then generate work. Um, or that's and their dream. I did that too. I mean, okay. I, I started a I, I I started a band with a few friends of mine, and then they eventually kicked me out of the band because they wanted to do more gigs in New York. And I was living in Boston. And so I was driving from Boston yeah, that's a lot of to fun. New York on like a Tuesday night to play like the 19th hole at midnight and then driving back the same night um, and then having to go to my day job the next day. This was after I graduated Berkeley. Ooh. So um, it was getting rough. And, uh, yeah. and so then they were like, yeah, well, you know, we took a vote and we're going to switch to using this guy in New York City. So. <laughs> 
I was like, whatever, man. Okay. 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 So I, at that uh, point you're over yeah. it. Yeah, and then yeah. I, I started another group um, that was just going to be like almost like a casuals band. Like uh, in Boston, there's a, a huge college scene there. I think uh, I read once that there's more colleges per square foot in Boston, Massachusetts than anywhere else in the world. Wow. Um, like there's little tiny colleges and then there's big universities. Sure. And I mean, it's a huge college town. So there's a lot of live music. There's a lot of kids that like to go out mm. and party. Mm. And uh, I don't know if it's still this way, but, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, bands could make a lot of money playing mm. at the gotcha. bigger bars and nightclubs. But you had to do cover songs sure. and it had to be kind of pop rock music. And, yeah. you know, so um, a lot of the guys that I went to school with, excuse me, they were really focused on doing original music and honing their craft as musicians mm -hmm. and and artists and i was like forget that man i just want i just want to make some money you know i'd rather play music yeah. making money than you know sitting at a desk staring at spreadsheets but um and then go practice at home yeah, that's yeah. right that's and right so yeah, yeah, yeah. uh so i was like you know i i started a band that was just going to be cover songs and uh just to try to play like the big club circuit and then um, I ended up moving out here as I was putting that together and I moved out to LA. So I never really mm. got that completely off the ground, but. So you land foot here. Mm -hmm. What was next? What happened? Um, you know, the first thing I did when I moved out here, I, um, through the Ber Berkeley alumni network, I got a job teaching music at, uh, teaching, uh, drum set lessons at a, uh, a, a youth center in South central LA called a place called home. And oh, uh, cool. it's a phenomenal place. It's still there. That's um, awesome. You know, they have an amazing arts program. Um, when I was there back in the early 2000s, Dr. Dre, uh, Suge Knight, Will Smith, they donated a ton of money to create the music program. Janet Jackson donated a ton of money to create the dance program. That's cool. Um, it's free for any kids 18 and under. Um, and it's open all day. They serve food all day for the kids. Uh, there's a lot of kids that go there that are homeless. Uh, there's a, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of kids that would try to get locked into the bathrooms at night so that they wouldn't have to sleep on the streets. And you know what? These kids are just so amazing. Like, is, is at home? What is yeah, it? A place called a home. Place. Okay. And, uh, it's in South Central. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, there it is. Excellent. Um, but... Phenomenal place. Um, it had a tie-in with uh, Berkeley College of Music for a while. I, it still might. Um, but we were, for the kids that really excelled mm -hmm. in our music program, Berkeley would offer them um, partial tuition scholarships and some full scholarships to the summer program. So mm. they could go to Berkeley for the five-week summer program and oh, experience cool. that. And then if they wanted to go to college there, um, they could apply for scholarships and, you know, try to get scholarships as well. Very cool. Um, and this is just APCH.org yep. for our listeners. A yep. place called Home, home yeah. HPCH.org. Yeah, APCH, yep. Uh, so phenomenal organization. I worked there for a while. I worked there for a few years, but... Um, after working there for about six months, uh, I ended up, I, w I was applying at studios. You know, it's funny because right. I thought to myself, well, I know how to do sound engineering. And um, it's a good plus. If I can get a gig, a, a buddy of mine worked at uh, a record label out here. And he said, you know, I was talking to this drummer and he was in one of the bands that got signed to our record label. And he said that he got the gig with the band just because he was an assistant engineer at the studio mm -hmm. that they were trying to record at. And after they fired their drummer, you know, he was just <laughs> talking to them. So I was like, hmm, maybe I should try to get a gig as an assistant engineer out here. So I started applying at different studios and I was looking at different studios. And... Um, uh, one of the studios I applied to was this place called Megatrax, and they had done, they do this thing that I'd never heard of before called library music. Right. Um, I didn't know anything about it. This was circa. Uh, this was two thousand and one. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I, I moved here December eighteenth of two thousand. Okay. So, and then right around May of two thousand and one, I got uh, I got the job over at Megatrax. So, so you went, and you heard about it, yep. you inquired, you. Uh, I found out about it actually through the Berkeley Alumni Network. Oh, okay. um, Berkeley, Again, they have a strong yeah, alumni. You know, it's it's crazy. Yes. I can trace 
every gig I've ever gotten or every dollar that I've ever made in the music industry back to going to that school. Amazing. So, um, that's testament to yeah, the fact that it's yeah, worth it. You know, I mean, when you yeah. look, when I was looking at schools to go to, uh, this is for the, I guess the younger listeners, if there's kids sure. out there that are, are listening to this, um, when I was in high school and I was trying to find what college to go to, uh, I wanted to go to music school. I knew that. Right. And, um, I started looking at the, uh, career placement rates of graduates that's a statistic that Very most colleges smart. have to report and Very you know smart. i was looking at you know like university of north texas and nyu you know tish mm -hmm. inside nyu has a school of music mm -hmm. and eastman school of music and u miami mm -hmm. and and a, a lot of them their placement rate uh their um you know the within five years after graduation it was usually around 20 to 25 percent of the graduates had a job in the field that they got their major in. Okay. Berkeley's was 86% oh. at that time. I, I imagine it's probably higher now. So, uh, and this down. is, this isn't Berkeley, California. This is Berkeley, Berkeley School, of music School of Music with two E's. Yeah. B Boston, yeah. B E R K L E E. Right. So, um, Thank I was like, okay, well that is a really strong motivation That's to go there. Is, yes. And, um, and then after going through the school, um, you start to realize that, you know, the alumni, just like with Harvard or MIT or, you know, Yale, the alumni all stick together. It's mm -hmm. almost like we all went through the same boot camp, you That's know, right. so we all know kind of the same musical language. We all know what mm -hmm. we all had to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of know, you know what to expect, at least, you know, when, you, when you're working with somebody that went somewhere else, you don't know you know, what they went through and what classes they were required to take and what they so didn't, true. you know, stuff like that. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I can trace pretty much every gig, including, you know, the album that I got nominated for a Grammy for all the way back to going to Berkeley. So, wow. um, you know, it's kind of a, a prop to the school, but. Excellent. Um, That's, hey, it's a good. Yeah, prop. I was glad yeah. I was, when I was walking around, I went to, um, some other universities uh, around the or around the country, I won't say which ones, but I was just floored. I would walk in to their music school, mm. and this is what I heard. <laughs> it was dead silence, silent, <laughs> and I can remember waiting to take one of the. Um, the entrance entrance exams, you know, you had to do like a music theory test and I'm waiting outside to take a music theory test. And there was a kid playing bass, like electric bass, just yeah. kind of noodling and practicing scales and stuff yeah. in the hallway and at one of these other schools. And um, one of the teachers walked by and told him to stop. Oh, come on. And said that he was disturbing the classrooms. But that's what you're there to do. And then you go to Berkeley College of Music. And that's all you need. And <laughs> there is music mm -hmm. coming from that school 22 hours a day. They shut it down from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning so that the cleaning crews can go through and really? clean. Really? But there is music happening 22 hours every day of the week from 8 a.m. to 6 a.m. every day. That's incredible. Everywhere. I mean, you go down by the the um, the mailboxes. There's all these kids with practice drum practice pads because the height, like you know, you, you take a couple steps down to get to the mailboxes. So if you turn around and put a chair down, it's the perfect. floor is the perfect oh, height to practice that. on. There's everybody. Everybody has guitars everywhere. Yeah, Everybody's right. singing in the hallways everywhere uh, they go. Pra you know, all the vocalists are always practicing singing as they're walking around. So music just comes at you from everywhere. You're hearing music come out of every classroom. That's you know, cool. bands performing teachers playing examples and so um that's one of the things that really drew me to it but yeah, uh, awesome. i'm going off on tangents now but um no that's so, brilliant i love it um yeah so through the berkeley alumni network um they had a job posting for an assistant engineer at, at megatracks. megatracks and so i went over there to interview and uh it was it was really cool the thing that i really liked about it i get bored very easily mm. and that was one of the things that i always had a problem with I being in a band yeah. you know being in a band and you're playing the same set or the same two sets yeah. over and over and over and then you practice them over and over and over and one of the cool things when i was doing the interviews at megatrax um was that uh they do all different styles of music and it's always different every week 
So one week you're doing heavy metal, the next week you're doing um, big band jazz, the next week you're doing a string quartet, the next week you're doing salsa music. The, you know, yeah. it's just it's always different. It's always changing. And so that really appealed to me. So, um, you know, I applied and I went through the process and they have a, a big process that you usually go through mm -hmm. um, to try to get a job there. It's not just like an interview and you shake a hand. It's like sure. they sit you down in front of an editing system and they're like, okay, we need you to see, we need to see you edit this stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sit you down in front of a Pro Tool system. Okay. Set up a recording session and put the headphone sense on this and do this. And, you know, so right. you have to, you have to kind of know your stuff and they have tests that you had to do um, to prove that. Sure. And so I did all of those. Um, but the funny thing is um, the chief engineer told me this years later um, but the reason why, or he says, maybe it's jokingly, but um, it's kind of a good story. He said the reason why I got the gig over everybody else that applied, um, he is a big fan of the Microsoft Logitech trackball where you use your thumb yes. to move the trackball and then you use your fingers to click instead of like the Kensington, which is right. like the huge ball where you use your fingers. I have the Kensington, yeah, yeah. I have carpal tunnel syndrome from trying to do drum core. And oh, so no. I got I got really really bad carpal tunnel syndrome, and so I had trouble using a mouse, and so I always had that Microsoft Logitech oh. with the trackball the and that thumb track yeah, with ball. the thumb yes. trackball, and so wow. every every guy that came in to interview and sat down and Tripped went to do the that. test, they they just mm -hmm. couldn't figure out how to use the mm -hmm. trackball. I was the only guy that walked in and sat down. I was like, oh, okay, cool, yeah. and he literally said to me. Uh, you know, is that okay? Do you know how to use that trackball? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I love these things. I have one of them at home. Yeah. And you know, that he was, was like, okay, <laughs> done. You know, it's the it's the it's the little, it's things, the little things you know that set you the, apart. The relatability, yeah. man. Yeah. The other thing yeah. too that he said, which um, nowadays, That's especially awesome. for younger kids, is is probably something to think about. Uh, I was the only person that actually showed up in a suit for the first interview. Very cool. It was a very kind of more like uh, chic, like entertainment, sure, you know, industry style a suit. Hip it, suit. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't like you know an FBI. Suit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I remember it was like an all black suit with like this uh, gold nice. satin tie. You know, but uh, you know, I took it seriously enough where I went the extra mile and you know That's got right. dressed up. You know, out of respect yes. and. Uh, those two things were kind of, and I've been there now for uh, almost uh, 19 years. Wow. Yeah. That's so, impressive. And uh, so I was working there and doing the, a place called Home Thing for a little while. And then after a couple of years, I just got so busy at Megatracks okay. that I just, I had to let the, uh, a place called Home gig uh, mm. go. And I stopped teaching there, but uh, you know, I love since, that place. Uh, since I've known you, you're, you're incredibly busy over there. Um, how did we meet? Through I, it was through Megatrack, so I want to see who was. Um, wasn't it through? I remember the way mm -hmm. I remember it. Uh, Wilfredo Reyes Jr. Wilfredo recommended you. Oh, that's right. So because he kept saying, "Man, do you know yeah, Michael Rapol? Do you know right. Nomad? Do you know Nomad?" Yeah. I'm like, "No, man, I don't. I don't know. Back then I don't it wasn't know this even guy." Nomad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, "You got to get this Michael. guy. You got to get this guy to to record oh, guitar for you." Right. And I'm like, I'm "Okay, Wally. okay, okay." Yeah. And you know, he kept saying, "Oh, you know, his big thing is acoustic guitars too, but he does electric as well." And blah blah blah. blah. Yeah. And then uh, we had something come up where uh, we needed. I think it was acoustic guitars. Yes. And so I was like, "Hey, you know what? We should try this guy." Yeah. And that's when we brought you in. That's right. Right, fantastic. So, Good. See, yeah. I should have just asked you. You have the the perfect memory. While Fredo Reyes Jr. is now playing uh, percussion with Chicago, I think so. Yeah, yeah. he plays yeah. percussion with so many different people. I'm I know. not sure, but uh, he plays percussion and drums amazingly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and it, Very cool. you know that's kind of one of the cool things about working at Megatrax. Um, you know, he was one of the guys that we would hire to come in and play all the time. That's right. I mean, we've had like being a drummer, like I always geek out on the drummers. Oh, so yeah. you know, I mean, we've had a lot of really big name drummers Tell come us. through. Oh, just you know, all the big guys like Vinnie Caliuta and you know Greg Bissonette and Walfrey to rise junior and, Wally, yeah. and uh you know just to sit there and like i'm setting up microphones on their drum set and i'm watching them play and i'm like oh my god I yeah, can't yeah. Play. <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> everybody awesome. would freak out with you know like a, a big artist like oh uh, you know sure. so and so is in the studio yeah, yeah, yeah. you know bon jovi's coming there whoever right, you know right, right. uh you know and i'm i could care less about stuff like that i'm like Oh, oh my God! You know, you Vinnie Peter Erskine, come in. Or, yeah, 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 exactly. Right. You know, so J.R. Robinson. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. you know, you get these guys that come in, and very uh, cool. So that that's kind of one of the fun things about working at Megatrax is, um, you know, we get the the owners 
are musicians. And so, you know, the music comes first, especially in the music publishing industry now. There's a lot of companies that are owned by venture capital firms or investment bankers or corporations. And so, you know, the music is just a commodity that they push Mm -hmm. to make their money. Uh, But one of the things that I love about Megatrax is the music always comes first, you know. And, um, you know, we don't necessarily have to hire live musicians for everything you do in an EDM album. It's mm-hmm. not like we have to start, you know, sure. calling around to find live trumpet players, you know, for EDM. <laughs> but it, if it makes sense to do it, we do it. That's one of the great things about working there. That's what I love about you guys. You you do hire everybody yeah. from a, a producer, programmer, DJ guy yep. to the the most incredible world class musicians, like you said. Yep. The the thing that we try to do is we try to find the guys that do it for real, mm-hmm. and then we try to hire them to come in and do it uh with us there you so, go so uh from the composers to the musicians you know yeah. uh, and everything in between arrangers orchestrators everybody so um that's kind of one of the fun things you tell know, us you, about some of the bigger projects that you've done that you're really uh, proud of um uh, there's so many i, mean, I, I know there's I, so many so just to put this in perspective so i've been there for um uh, 18 like almost 19 years yeah. and um I added it up the other day uh, from uh, the day that I got there until like a month or two ago. I've done uh, over 700 albums. I think it was like 735 <laughs> albums. Um, oh, my goodness. So the way we do it, we're kind of like a hybrid between incredible a record label and, um, you know, uh, like uh, some musicians may be familiar with uh, the more like royalty free music libraries where right. oh hey i've got 30 rock tracks let me just throw them up there and see if they make any money sure um we do targeted albums so we talk to our clients and um we focus our efforts on music that clients are going to want to use and we package it in a way that makes it easy for them to find so we make albums Mm -hmm. the way a record label would make an album or whatever but uh it's targeted towards like hey we're gonna do a sports rock album for sports channels hey we're gonna do um you know tv uh, music for tv commercials so we do an album of uh you know music that's specifically geared for tv commercials and it could be in a specific style so um you know we do albums just like a regular record label would but we just do it on a scale that is uh, not normal for most record labels. It's, it's much larger. Yeah, last you year, are... uh, we just since we just finished out the year, I did I had to do a bunch of analytics on the production that we did last year and budgets and all this other stuff. Uh, we did 100 and, what, 176 albums last year, Jeez. or that I was directly responsible for. So one of the other things that we do too. Wow. Yeah, so we make our own music in, in-house. We call it in-house, where... Yeah. Uh, you know, we're in charge of it, we're overseeing it, we're producing it. Uh, but then we represent other companies as well as a, what they call a sub-publisher. So for example, um, there might be a music company in Germany mm-hmm. and they are doing their own thing in Germany, but they don't have any representation in the United States. So mm-hmm. then they approach us and we then represent them in the US. Uh, you know, there's another company. That's brilliant. Uh, there's a, a couple of companies in the UK that we represent here in the US. Um, so on top of the 176 albums that we did in-house that is just ours, we also then represent all this other music from other people. So I think, I think we do about... Uh, I want to say it's like 400 or 500 albums a year, a year. with all of the third party uh, catalog. And as 165 well. of which you were responsible yeah. for last year. 176. Now, oh, 176. Yeah. Looking at the website here, by the way, it's megatracks.com. What mm-hmm. I love about it, and you just said that, you're making specific projects. So they have a Valentine's Day playlist. Yeah. Uh, this is just on the top banner The yeah. Sound of 2020. It sound, looks futuristic. Uh, Spring Break yeah. uh, compilation here, Mardi Gras compilation. Compilation, you know, happy hip hop mm-hmm. compilation. Uh, That's an interesting uh, thing about hip hop. Hip hop nowadays is very dark. 
Ah, yeah. So to go and do but, something with happy hip hop, but dark, Very cool. dark, sad music, yeah, doesn't really get people excited about anything. <laughs> so TV commercials and All TV right. shows, they're always go. asking, like, yeah, do you have any like happy, upbeat hip hop music? Uh, and it's really hard to find. So, uh, so I mean, that's why we put that together. Immediately, for them. I think of DJ Jazzy Jeff yep. and the Fresh Prince, right? Yeah. So he's trying to get more stuff like that. Uh, well, that we would Although call a retro. Dated, that's yeah, retro. That we would call yeah, a retro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, basically, what you're doing is you're you're trying to take uh, some of the hip hop and trap sounds of today. Oh, right. But then mm-hmm. you're you're doing a. a a, a beat or a composition, Very if you want cool. to call it, that's more uh, faster tempo, yeah. more major key instead of minor key. Like Atlanta mm-hmm. Trap is kind of like the big thing or has mm-hmm. been the big thing for licensing. Music licensing always follows behind the billboard trends. Right. Usually by about a year, maybe uh, anywhere from like nine months to a year and a half. So something big will come out, uh, you know, on the radio and on, uh, you know, uh, Spotify now, I guess. Right, right, right. right. And, uh, and after it's gained a certain amount of traction, yeah. that's when everybody in TV and film starts to say, oh, well, you oh, know what, that would be cool. That, that would be cool like... if I could put that, yeah. you know. I love that sound. We should do something like that yeah. in ours. So, And then that's kind of where we come in. But yeah. the funny thing is a lot of the music that's written by artists, it doesn't really work that well in syncing to picture with dialogue going on top and mm. all this other stuff. So um, that's kind of where we come in. You know, a lot of people used to look at music libraries as kind of like, oh, well, that's just like a cheap knockoff. But mm-hmm. um, but now... The I quality mean, the, is so yeah, good. It's not a know, knockoff. I mean, especially I can for us with that. our studio. Yeah, you with know, your like, state-of-the-art studio. Yeah. But you know what I was going to say? I noticed that trend when the Black Keys came out. And then, like you say, uh, maybe nine to 12 months or so later... Every TV commercial had like a black keys sound alike guitar yep. riff and those old school drums. You know, it's like it's yeah. so funny that you mentioned that. Yeah. That is spot on. And now too, record labels are starting to realize the power of you know, just film of, and TV placements. License. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember hearing stories about uh, Imagine Dragons. Imagine Dragons That's got right. put on the map because of I think they got a placement in a TV show and a placement mm-hmm. on a TV commercial almost back to back within a few weeks of each other. And then all of a sudden, all the radio stations and, you know, uh, yeah, all of the streaming sound. services and stuff started getting emails and phone calls like, hey, do you have that Who's group that? from that from that show or from that, you know, spot? Wow. And it put them on the map, you know? Wow. Um, so there's a lot of power in doing music for visual media. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, if, if, uh, if you can write a track that works really well, there are phenomenal songs that just never work for placement in TV and film because maybe right. they're too distracting. Um, well, you know, expound too on that. So if 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 you if you have an artist that comes to you or a musician mm-hmm. and you say or you you know you yep. track them down, hey, create this project for me. What are some of the things that we might find? Now, for those who don't know, oftentimes you guys will administer a brief. Mm -hmm. We'll get a brief of what the client wants, what you're looking for. What are some of the things that you tell the musician or artist that might not be on the brief or that are more nuanced? What do you, you know? Well, and this is uh, something that I talk about a lot when I do seminars and I speak at things. Um, there's a couple of key things that you have to think about when you're writing music for licensing and TV and film, or even when you're playing on tracks uh, for licensing and TV and film. And that is the cliche. Hmm. The cliche is very important for um, what we do. We're not trying to break new ground. We're not trying to be the innovator. Uh, You know, nobody is coming to a music library to find the next new sound that nobody's wow. ever heard That's before. Right. That's right. You know, uh, I had this one guy I asked for, um, uh, I, I don't remember his name, but I would, I wouldn't say it anyway, but uh, <laughs> I remember I asked for, um, I needed happy acoustic ukulele music. We've all heard that, right. you know, sure, ching, sure. you know, happy, yeah. you know, hand claps, <laughs> yes. you know, maybe tambourine. Very common yeah. in commercials. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And he sends me back, Uh these recordings um that were kind of uh new agey jazz virtuoso type playing ukulele with tons of reverb and delay on it um soloing 
over yeah. the entire thing uh, uh, with like these lush keyboard pads and, you know, some mm. ambient percussion. And like, I could just see him as he's recording it, throwing his hair around <laughs> with a fan blowing on him. And, and you know, <laughs> I mean, it was the most epic ukulele I have ever heard before like you in my life. you see it live in concert. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It almost sounded like he was using nylon string guitar. I mean, it was oh, like, wow. imagine like Yanni, wow. imagine Yanni on a, uh, on a, um, on a ukulele. That's kind of what this sounded like. And I mean, it was like insane. Said, virtuosic. But yeah, I was virtuosic. like, dude, I can't, yeah. I can't use this. Like I need happy ukulele music. Wow. And then he kind of got all mad. Like, this is amazing. This is oh, true yeah. art. And it's like, well, dude, that's, but that's not you know, what we're doing. Yeah. Here. We're a very specific you know, pitch. Yeah. We yeah. are. It, it's almost like uh, if, if a musician, if a musician were to think about the sounds that they use when they create a song, you know, like you have your different virtual instruments and the sounds mm -hmm. in them. That is kind of what we are to people that make TV shows and TV commercials and films. We are one element mm. that gets put together with other elements to make a final composite uh, product. Great analogy. Um, you know, and so you would never want, like, if you're a guitarist, you would never want a drum groove or a drum beat that just completely overshadows the guitar that's out right. of your virtual instrument. And, you know, sometimes that's what happens with music when they put it up against picture. And it's like, well, I can't even pay attention to what this guy is saying because this music is just it's so just, distracting. Right. And so, um, you know, not that it has to be boring, but you just, you have to um, think of ways to keep it interesting without being so obtuse and mm. you know in your face uh and i would i would say uh, for anybody working with production music libraries especially of, of your magnitude be open be pliable mm -hmm. a great example is yep. the last project you and i just did together you commissioned me for it yep. you said i need some hybrid flamenco you sent me about five or six yep. actual audio references said this is what the client is looking for yep. has to be all original of course yep uh, I sent them in my first drafts because you said do some drafts, yep. send them to us. Yep. I sent them to Derek and you were great. You gave me very specific notes. You mm -hmm. said, okay, this one uh, needs to change this. It might be a little too happy here. Yep. Maybe work with the temple. And then the second one, you gave me all those notes. Yep. I, in turn, went back and instead of saying, what? I can't believe this, man. Yeah. Who do you think you are? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this I is my artistic genius. Yeah. You know? yeah. I made the adjustments. Yeah. You came back. You said, yeah, I think that'll work. You know, yeah. but we did a couple more little finishing touches. Bam, the project yeah. got done. Absolutely. So for those musicians out there looking to get into this line mm -hmm. of work, you have to be yeah. pliable, easy to work yep. with. You have to be able to take direction mm -hmm. yep. and and follow instructions because, yeah. like, you, like I said, and stick they to give cliches. You the and that was the, yes, my whole point. Stick like, to the cliche. like, if if, if a company says, "Hey, you know, we need some Chicago blues tracks." Don't try to do Chicago blues infused with some hip hop infused with some <laughs> funk. Because <laughs> when you start to blur the lines Ooh, like that, good advice. When you start to blur the lines like that, mm. for somebody that's trying to pick music for a scene that mm. they're working on, say it's say that hey, I need some Chicago blues for this bar scene, you mm -hmm. know, and it's you know like a like a roadhouse bar, yeah. and people are drinking and whatever, right. and it might and be the, a time and piece, and the characters walk yeah. in, right? All of a sudden now they throw your piece underneath it, and there's hip hop drums, and yeah. it's like it doesn't match it doesn't the way work. anybody in the scene looks. It doesn't, you right. know. So, um, you know, it, you have to kind of think um, within the the cliches. Like if I'm going to do an '80s rock album, I'm going to make it as '80s rock as I can. If I'm going to do right. um, a modern hip hop album. I'm gonna to try to make it as modern as I can. Like uh, if we're gonna do a big band album, it's gonna be mm -hmm. 1940s, 1960s style big band. And you know, we'll specify like, hey, we're looking for funk. What kind of funk? Well, we're looking for psychedelic funk, or mm. we're looking for, you know, right. uh, 60s James Brown funk, or we're looking for, you know, kind of the 90s, uh, you know, electric funk like um, 
everything from like Herbie Hancock to Aquarium Rescue Unit and all those types of oh, groups. Oh, yes. So, you know, like... We, AQI, I can't believe you dude, pulled that out. I love those guys. One of my favorite bands. Colonel Bruce Hampton in the Aquarium Absolutely. Rescue Unit. Yeah. Absolutely, man. <laughs> That's O'Teal awesome. on bass, O'Teal man. O'Teal Burbage. <laughs> man, we need a high five on that dude. one, dude. Yeah, I love those guys. Now, that's some musoid stuff. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I love how you guys are so specific. Yeah. That's and fantastic. you have to be because, yeah. um, you know, you want to be able to hit the nail on the head because right. we make albums because we know there's a demand for them yeah. uh, or we know there will be a demand for them. And right, so right, 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 right. we want to make sure that it fits the need. So if we're too ambiguous, then the music's too ambiguous and then nobody can use it. But see, you just said something very important. You know the demand. Your company does the market research. Absolutely. So you guys have a department yeah. devoted yeah. to that, right? And that's, and that's one of the reasons why it can be beneficial. Like everybody always asks me, what's the difference between... Um, going with one of these online royalty free places where mm-hmm. I just put the music up or going with like a bigger music publishing company or a smaller publishing company or just doing it myself. That's the mm-hmm. big thing I hear now. Well, why can't I just do it myself? Why can't I just do the licensing myself? And you can't. you don't have the relationships and though. One of the things I tell people is you should do everything. Um, you know, in the music industry, you end up having f- five to 10 different careers to make one career. You have to be able to be, do everything. You should do everything. You should diversify. It's like your investment portfolio. You should never put all your eggs in one basket. But for us... Oh, one, hold on. What? Say that thought. Okay. Because one of my final questions of, is words of wisdom. And what you just said really is the <laughs> wisest word of wisdom. Please say that again. That was fantastic. Uh, well, you, you have to diversify. A career in music yeah. requires that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a career in music isn't just one thing. Like, I've gotten a lot of gigs by moving sideways. That's right. And, you know, a lot of other guys get gigs by moving sideways, too. Like, you might play guitar on something, and the bass player in the group, uh, you're talking to him, and they find out that, oh, hey, you know, I, you know, am also an arranger, and he knows somebody that's, that's looking right. for an arranger. Now you get an arranging gig, yeah. and, and you producer, keep... Yeah, and, oh, this. you write you, music, too? Yeah. Oh, well, dude, you know, there like, you, you came in as a as a musician playing on stuff, and then you're like, yeah, dude, I write, too. And I'm it's like, composer. dude, well, let me hire you to write some stuff. So, you, you know, you can kind of get gigs sideways, you know, by moving, uh, like, horizontally or laterally right. instead of yes. just moving straight up. And and so uh, even for me, uh, on top of doing this stuff at Megatrex, I do a lot of freelance stuff, too. And uh, I've been a dialogue editor and a re-recording mixer. I've, mm-hmm. uh, now I mix the score for several shows on Netflix with composers. Wow. So, so you, you know, you kind of move sideways, That's you right. know. And it keeps it interesting. It keeps it fun. It lets you do different things so you're not so – you don't get bored from, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. That's but, uh, right. But, Sorry, um, I had to get no, that. No, yeah, yeah, but yeah, good stuff. Okay. You want to diversify. One of the yes. one of the good things about going with one of the bigger companies mm-hmm. in our industry, in one of the bigger music libraries, is just the staff. Um, and a lot right. of people don't realize the reach. Uh, Megatrex, for example, I think we have 12 or 15 licensing people. Their sole job is to Incredible. wake up every morning and start calling every music supervisor, every TV company, every... Uh, media and marketing department of every co- corporate company mm-hmm. in in actually all of the Americas. Um, yeah. Megatrax is directly licensed in Central and South America as well, mm. not just the U.S. Mm. Um, so we have an office in Rio de Janeiro. We have an office in Bogota, Colombia. And then we've got several offices across the United States. Um, but whereas most other music catalogs will have a sub-publisher represent them in Cent- Central America and South America, um, we represent yeah, ourselves we, we have licensing people wow. that um speak uh that are brazilian and speak portuguese and are from central uh america that speak spanish, spanish. and right. so um you know we have one guy in miami and uh and then we have uh a couple people in texas and one person in san diego and they just canvas central and south america for us wow so um yeah, so the you know, reach coming, is real. The, yeah, yeah, coming to, and then we have sub publishers too in Europe and stuff. We're in about seventy countries worldwide. So when, wow. uh, when, yeah, it's really funny. A, a composer <laughs> that I know uh, that I met when I went to London to record. Um, well, actually, I met him before that, but uh, we finally met face to face, and I started uh, hiring him to to do albums. Um, he did his first album for for the catalog that we do called Track Distillery. Mm, and uh, right. he has a TuneSat account where TuneSat 
uh, uses uh, fingerprinting like Shazam, mm-hmm. and it um, monitors TV broadcasts to find the music that you've written. So you upload the tracks that you've written to TuneSat, and then it monitors all of the TV stations in your country wow. and then tells you when it detects your music being used. And he had been using it for a couple of years, and he would get, you know, 10 detections, you know, okay. 15 detections a month or whatever. And then um, our album came out here, and when we release it, we release it worldwide. So uh, in we're represented with, uh, I believe it's um, Sony EMI in the UK, where he lives, and uh, they released it uh, almost simultaneously to us. Within a month, his TuneSat account was blown up. And he hit the limit because they have like tiered limits, like, <laughs> um, you know, like the nine ninety nine a month sure, you know, covers sure. you for, you know, whatever it is, 500 mm-hmm. detections. And then, you, you know, you have to go up and up and up. And um, like within uh, I think it was like within the first week that it came out, um, he just had so many. He literally emailed me and was like. I cannot believe how many <laughs> it just came out. How how did this how happen? Did you, right. And it's you know we are a, a bigger company. We work with other bigger companies around the world, um, right. and we just have the staff. You know, for one person to try to do that themselves, oh, it's in, it's, it's it's ridiculous, impossible. You know, and, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't. You know, it's right. just there's certain albums that you focus mm-hmm. on for, you know, if you're going to try to do licensing on your own, you have the albums that you keep for yourself and you and go then, around and right. maybe they're the more unique ones that are a little bit more artist driven and you that's go around right. to the music supervisors and music directors and stuff like that yourself and try to pitch it. But you try to get your own deals, you yeah, know, draw, drum absolutely. up your own business, yeah. so to speak. But but coming the, to a bigger company like yes. Megatrex, you have that weight behind you, you have all these people working your music. I mean, we have four That's people right. in the publishing department. We have, like I said, 12 or 15 licensing people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we are just all pushing the music that we are releasing. Um, all the time. All the time. <laughs> and um, so it just it just elevates. It just all of a sudden you start to notice, hey, wow, you know, I'm getting thousands of uses right. every month. I'm getting tens of thousands of uses every That's month. Right. And um, it just builds and builds over The Career Musician Podcast is a member of the Pantheon Podcast Network, the first all-music-based podcast collective. For more info, visit pantheonpodcasts.com. Hi, I'm Derek Jones, director of production and producer for Megatrax Production Music, and I am a career musician. This is the Career Musician Podcast with your host, Nomad. Let me ask you this, for the musician out there, the composer, artist, musician, Mm -hmm. who wants to get involved with a company like Megatrax, what's the best way to go about that? How do they actually reach you guys and present their material? I am not going to lie, it is tough. (laughs) Um, It is. We get, we, for a little while, we opened up... uh, you know, solicitation just from anybody. I think we created an email address, submissions or something like that at Megatrax. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were getting about, I think it was 100 or 150, 100 to 150 submissions every day. A day. A yeah. day. That's incredible. And um, while we have a big licensing staff, the publishing uh, the the publishing staff is only a couple people. Uh, it's like four people. Production-wise, it's, you know, uh, it's basically the two owners me and then uh an assistant engineer and um you know a second engineer so um there's not a lot of us to look at this stuff and then we have two music directors that do searches and they kind of know the catalog inside and out but um to try and submit stuff we just never had time to get through it all so um I've always said this, you'll see me online or at um, conferences, I always mm-hmm. say face-to-face is always the best way, unfortunately. I say the same thing, it's relationships. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. you can yeah. uh, you can send emails, uh, which are good, um, if, if they get through and we see them and we can use them, great. A lot of times we get a lot of phenomenal music, but we just don't have a use for it right then. Right. And... You know, production cycles are cyclical, so it's like if we just came, like, say you do the most amazing um, alternative rock, Mm -hmm. but 
we might have just come out with four alternative rock albums two mm-hmm. months ago and then you submit and it's like well we just did Bad four timing. albums right we need to focus on doing some jazz or some you know music for tv commercials so we might not come back around to alternative rock for another six months another That's year right. another 12 you know 16 months maybe so um sometimes it can be a timing thing mm-hmm. um and you know sometimes it's just oh well this is good but it's not the exact type of alternative rock that we're looking for. Right. And with so many people trying to place music, it's hard sometimes to reply back because there's nobody, no matter yeah, what company you're talking about, there's usually never a person designated for that specifically to do that. That's right. It's always like, like me, like I'm responsible for overseeing the production process of all of these albums and make sure that they're moving forward and make sure that they're hitting the mark. Oh, and then also on top of that, you know, I have to <laughs> I have to help with the publishing department, make sure that all the composer information is correct, because I know the composers, the publishing department doesn't really know. You the have composers, the relationships, you yes. Know? And then, uh, you know, then I have to uh, check, I have to work with the finance department because production spends a lot of the money of the company. And so wow. then I'm, you know, so I have That's all incredible. these things that I'm doing. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, you also have to, you know, find new composers and and talk to new composers so i tell people all the time you know if if you do email me like if we meet and we talk and right. we exchange information and you email me and you don't hear from me just ping me again just do a little nudge right yeah that's right. i mean i usually get between 100 and 200 emails every day in my Ooh. inbox for work and like i just start yeah. from the top and i'm working my way down yeah and there's usually you know catastrophes and fires that I have to deal with and put out, and so I may never get down through all of the emails for that day, mm-hmm. and then the and next then day they starts. Pile up. That's and right. so, like, uh, if you look at my inbox right now, if I logged in and yikes. looked at my inbox, I think I have about four thousand unread emails in my <laughs> inbox. Um, <laughs> no no joke. You. No That's no joke. Incredible. So um, so yeah, sometimes wow. what happens is emails just fall through the cracks. Right. And I feel bad. I mean, like literally, like we could talk about doing an album, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. man, totally right, and I contract you, and yeah. then you send me the the rough mixes for approval right and two weeks goes by three weeks yeah. goes by for, and you're like what happened yeah I don't know. you know and then you email me again i'm like no man i never saw the email so um ah, but so, this is good information yeah. so and this so happens that with everybody everybody yeah. don't yeah. take offense to it yeah. don't take it personal absolutely yeah. just not send back yeah. a friendly reminder hey buddy yep. just checking up on the one i sent yep. the other day yeah that, that's a big thing is yeah. is following yeah. up with people follow through, follow and up. just um pinging people like hey yeah. what's going on it's been a few months here mm-hmm. you know i just did a, a new thing here's some new tracks that i did you know this right. is you know i i just did some blues stuff stuff and uh it just came out and it's really cool i could do some for you you know right f- coming right, up with excuses right. to keep pinging people um go. without being obnoxious like why aren't you responding to my emails <laughs> why don't you love me anymore you know <laughs> this, uh, this is the perfect segue because <laughs> one of the talking points is business acumen so yeah. you know and within that falls you know staying in touch following yeah. through so yeah. absolutely this, Great advice so, and insight. Yeah, you always have to um, come up with ways to ping people. That's um, right. But if you don't hear back, don't take it personally. Mm-hmm. Just try them again. There you, you know, go. And try them again. And be then persistent yeah. without being annoying. Yeah. And, and don't be rude. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, a lot of guys, uh, a lot of composers, when I talk to them, it seems like they'll maybe try to target like one or two libraries. Okay, well, I'm going to try to get into these two libraries. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to just keep sending them and only them stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like applying for a job. Like Mm. you want to try to find as many companies to send music to, to see what they're looking for. Cause you never know, you know, like when you are applying for a job, you don't go to one store or one company and hand in a resume and then wait to hear back and see if they, (laughs) and then when they finally do say no, then you go to the next one, (laughs) you know, like you canvas, like you send out, you know, canvassing. and so you have to, you have to do that to some degree because you never know. Like, like I said, alternative rock, we may have just finished doing alternative rock, but there may be another catalog that is now talking about doing alternative rock. And they're like, Oh, this is perfect timing. You know? So you yeah. never know. You you just have to keep sending stuff out there and and find you know different companies to write for. Um, the Production Music Association, uh, PMA, PMA Music, yeah. um, they are phenomenal. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, no, if you have to grab a call, we no, no, can no, stop. It was, just, it was just telemarketing as usual. Okay. <laughs> but uh, but um, I didn't know if the if the mic was picking up the little. Mm, oh, gotcha. Mm, mm, yeah. But um, so. Uh, you know, the uh, the PMA, the Production Music Association, is phenomenal. They have a conference once a year in September called PMC. the Production, yeah, PMC yeah. Production Music Conference. Um, 
that's a great place to go. It is. Music libraries from uh, around the U.S. and from Europe. And now mm -hmm. uh, some of them from Japan and stuff the are starting globe, to come to really. it. Yeah. It's a great way to just meet people. You never know who you're going to talk to. You, you know, sitting there at the Starbucks having a coffee during right. the PMC. And, oh, you start talking to a buddy of mine. This is a really great story. Um, a buddy of mine went to the first PMC. And afterwards, they had like a little cocktail hour. And he is like a punk rock guy, like a alternative rock, punk rock, right? Sure. And uh, he was in a band. He was actually the guitarist with uh, Hole, with Courtney Love, and uh, oh, wow. toured with her for a while and stuff yeah. like that. Great guy, amazing musician, uh, amazing uh, composer and songwriter and stuff too. And uh, he had started doing albums for us. And I was like, dude, you should come to the PMC thing, you know? Yeah. You, you never know what's going to happen. So he's sitting there and... He just gets a beer from the bar and he sits down and this guy sits down next to him, uh, older guy from the UK. And just within, I don't know, two or three sentences, the guy uh, from the UK is like, oh, all this new music is crap. Nobody knows how to make music, you know, like, like the old days. And he said, well, what kind of music do you like? And the guy's like, oh, well, I'm a big punk rock fan. And my buddy's like, me too, man. And they just had this huge conversation about punk rock for like, um, you know, I, I think it was like two or three hours. Wow. And then the guy's like, what do you do? He's like, well, I write music and I was in this band and yeah. now I write music and I write music for Megatrax. And, uh, and he said, we have to meet. You need to come to my office. And he's like, well, who are you? He's like, oh, well, my name's uh, uh, Russell. I run Extreme Music, which is now Sony uh, Production Music. Oh, wow. He was the CEO. The CEO. You know, and just oh, happened to sit down that. next to him and start up a conversation. And, and then he said he went over to the office and hung out with him for like four hours and talked music. And, and uh, you know, all of a sudden now he's writing for them and writing. for us, you know. Wow. So, uh, so you never know See, what's going to happen. Beautiful. A lot of guys, a lot of guys I know that go to the PMC, mm -hmm. um, afterwards, within about six months, they're like, oh, yeah, dude, now like I've got a bunch of libraries that I'm connected to work. and I'm, I'm working for and I'm writing for and, and you that's know, it's right. great. So, yeah. um, but the tough thing for anybody that's looking to get into this is it's a longer game. It is. Because while some companies will pay money up front for the album, some mm -hmm. don't. Um, some will do a revenue split, some mm -hmm. won't. Um, and some take larger portion of the back end pie than others. Yep. Yeah. Um, but you know, you'll usually always get your writer's royalties mm -hmm. as a as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes you'll get a split on the upfront money. Um, yep. but it takes a while to get the stuff out there and then find a use for it. And and so it takes a while to see your residuals. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I usually tell people it's it usually takes about two or three years of yes. actually really pursuing it. To to get it up and running. And That's right. A couple of guys that I know that have just recently gotten into it a few years ago, It's it's been about two years. After about two years of really focusing on it mm -hmm. and doing it, that's when they really start to see some decent money. That's and right. they're like, wow, you know, I could actually live off of this, you right, know, and, right, right. and really, you know, keep it going. So, But it's like anything else. It takes consistency, yep. dedication, what you put like in you said. Is what you yeah, get out, exactly. You know? I find myself in that, in that, uh, interesting purgatory kind yep. of space now where it, um, I'm seeing some good returns from it, mm -hmm. but not enough to live off of yep. because it's not my only focus. Yep, absolutely. If it were my only focus, I think yep. I could get it to that point of, yeah. of pure sustainability. Yep. But it does take some sacrifice to yep. get there. So it is kind of like yep. you have to rob Peter to pay Paul yep. when you're starting out. Yeah. So I guess the end game there is be patient, be yep. persistent, be yep. diligent. Absolutely. All of the cliches. Yep. Diversify, you know? try to write Diver for as many different companies as you can. And that's, you that's one of the things that I tell people too is um, different companies have uh, different fortes. They have different relationships with the same clients. So you never know, like, um, and this has happened before with us. Like I've had guys that uh, do a sports rock album for us. And they do a sports rock album for one of our competitors. Mm. And one of the guys will be like, oh, well, dude, my sports rock album with the other guy, with the other company has made a ton of money. Right. And then the second guy is like, dude, I did a sports rock, rock album for that exact same other company. It hasn't made any made money, but I've made, <laughs> I made crazy money <laughs> Over from, yeah, from yeah, yeah, the yeah. ones that you did. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 you yeah. know, it's like, um, it's hard to tell. It's a so, crap shoot. It, yeah. So yeah. What, what I tell people is, you know try different companies and see which That's ones right. work for you. So, right. you know, usually maybe, but it's not like, Hey, here's one song. Let me see if I make a lot of money from it. <laughs> That's um, what I always tell my friends. Yeah. 
you, it really is. I liken it to the penny stocks. It is, yeah. It, you have to put the content in. Yeah. Don't come to me with 10 cues and say, oh, yeah. I wrote 10 cues. How come I haven't seen any money? Yeah. No, give me a thousand cues. Yeah. Then we'll talk. Start with a hundred. Yeah. You know, let's get a hundred, 150. Yeah. Get your catalog. I usually say get your catalog to 300 cues. Yep. And get them in in, in circulation, yep. and then you'll start seeing something. Yeah, usually right? I tell people it's around two hundred fifty to three hundred yeah, is where you actually it. start to see money. But um, what I tell people too is just maybe try to get thirty in one catalog, thirty that's in right. another catalog, that's twenty right. or thirty in another catalog, that's right. and see if it starts to generate revenue. Yeah. You'll start to see, hey, you know, company X and Y. I'm doing pretty well with my 30 tracks in each one of them. Mm. Oh, but company Z, I'm not making any money from, mm. you know? So, okay, well, I'm going to keep trying to develop and give money to the ones that I'm making money from. And they will probably keep coming back to you to try to get money, uh, to get music because they're also making money. That's kind of one of the things. It's like when yeah. you make money, they make money. When they make money, you make money. So um, right. it's like a symbiotic relationship. It um, sure is. So, yeah. um, you know, that's kind of one of the the things that I always tell people to, to try to focus on is... Uh, just diversifying and put a little bit in in mm -hmm. every catalog and see which ones start to do pretty well and try different stuff. Don't do like if you can do ten jazz, ten rock, ten uh, orchestral, country, orchestral or country yeah. or whatever. That's better than just doing thirty of the same rock type of cues. That's right. Because if ten tracks aren't going anywhere with that catalog for whatever reason. You know, the rest aren't going to if they're all the same type of thing. So trying kind of to like a probationary catalog to see what yeah, where you it know, goes, like right. It, it's test. just it's like your writing style. How does it match up with mm. uh, that catalog and the clients that that catalog right. has? Um, so if I did, um, you know, uh, '70s funk. And I did 10 tracks of 70s funk, and then I did 10 tracks of like acoustic singer songwriter, and then I did 10 tracks of like electronic EDM. Maybe the EDM tracks all of a sudden start to make a ton of money, but the other ones don't. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, let me try doing more electronic Let's styles of music with that catalog, That's you right. know. But then you may have another catalog that you did 10 acoustic singer songwriter tracks for that blew up, but the electronic tracks you did for them didn't make yeah. anything. Right, so right, you right, kind right, of right, play right. the field, you know. A lot of if, a lot of guys tend to cling on to their music and they're mm. like, man, I wrote these 10 amazing songs. I don't want to let go of them. <laughs> you know, if you learn to get over if, that, <laughs> if you can't, uh, it, you know, this is like getting into doing what we do with this. This is like an industry. This is a career. So if you can only write 10 songs, then this isn't the industry for you. But That's if right. you can write 10 songs, you know, every week or every two weeks and different types of music, yeah, everybody has their forte. Like mm -hmm. don't ever, like this is another piece of advice. Don't ever walk up to people and say, oh yeah, I do everything. Ugh. I do everything well. That is I, the I kiss just, of you death. Know, I, yes. I wake up in the morning and I piss excellence, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, when you say I can do everything, that doesn't help. Like everybody has a no, forte. Every, everybody right. has something that they gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. Even if it's something that you like more, mm -hmm. you know, put that foot forward. That's like right. when somebody asks, oh, hey, what do you, you know, what kind of music do you got? Do you normally yeah. write? Do you do? Oh, well, uh, you know, I, I love everything. I try to do everything, but, uh, you know, I always gravitate towards, towards you know, X orchestral music or That's I gravitate right. towards Latin music or I gravitate mm -hmm. towards, uh, you know. Uh, so true, 50s yeah. blues or whatever you know it could right. be it could be anything you know rockabilly uh, you know that's, it could be anything so yeah, yeah. Um, you know kind of find what it is that you feel you mm -hmm. excel at and put that foot forward you can say I do other things too but always have that forte and mm -hmm. don't be afraid to say this is my forte. Mm -hmm. Some people may be looking for it, other people may not. We just did a rockabilly album a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one of the guitarists that does all the '80s uh, stuff for us, um, just talking to uh, the owner of Megatrax, he's like, "Oh yeah, man, I love rockabilly. I've got." And he started talking about like these rockabilly specific guitars yeah. that are like vintage and. And all of a sudden, the owner's like, man, why didn't I know this, like, yeah. a month ago? I would have brought you in to co-write the Rockabilly stuff with me, oh, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, it happens, yeah, you sure, know, like sure, timing sure. is everything, but don't be afraid to put, you know, Hey, well, this is like one of the fortes that I have, you right. know, it's you okay know, to have yeah. three, two, three. Yeah, Cause when you four, say, yeah. when you say you can do everything, yeah. then it's like, okay, well, we're going to Abbey road in six months and we're looking for stuff that sounds like John Williams. And we're also doing a big band album that needs to sound like Frank Sinatra. And we're also doing, um, a metal album that needs to sound like, you know, active Animals as leaders. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. active rock on, active, on the radio yeah. right now. Yeah. And we're doing a classic, you know, rock album right. that needs to sound like, you know, Bruce Springsteen. That's and right. so, okay, you're going to do, so all, you of do them. them yeah. all. You're going right. to do them all. Right. Yeah. yeah and then watch that person yeah. shit a brick. Yeah. yeah. You know, and Latin music. Oh, well, we need yeah. to do oh, some right. Latin salsa yeah. music, you know, <laughs> or some flamenco, yeah, yeah, oh, or yeah, really? flamenco, yeah, you know, like okay, uh, uh, what did I get myself into, you know? Yeah, it and, doesn't work that way, yeah. yeah so um, because each each style, each genre like that, especially the deeper ones, takes a lifetime yeah. to really get a hold of. Yeah, really I mean, one of the big things that we've been fingers. doing a lot because uh, we have a lot of clients in Mexico, we've been doing a lot of Mexican styles of music. Wow, yeah. cumbia, uh, norteña, yeah. um, mariachi, mariachi yeah. bolero. Wow. Um, you know, and just come in and say, yeah, I do Latin music. Okay, cool. Well, we need, <laughs> you know, so so we need generous. like 10 Norteñas yeah. and we need, you know, 10 Bandas. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> like Latin music means a lot of things to a lot of different people. That's so, right. um, you know, you need to, you need to be able to specify what it is that you actually, cause literally we do, we do everything from Tahitian log drumming wow. through, you know, uh, top 40 style pop songs. Right. You know, and Please we do not call me for Tahitian. Yeah, drum. exactly. But, <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, when you say, oh yeah, I do everything right to me, that, that's, that's everything. That's a dangerous phrase. You know? Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, that, know, this know your strengths, words, you know, know yeah. your strengths and know your yeah. weaknesses. It's beautiful. All right. You ready? We're going to wrap right. this up sure. with 10 maybe or so maybe rapid fire questions. All right. And I think I know the first one already, but I want—I'm right. curious because you're like me, we're foodies. By the way, when you hang with Derek, he's going to take <laughs> you to the best lunch spots this side of Texas. We got to give a shout out to 786 Pizza. 786 Pizza. Yeah. You took me there last year. I was blown away. Yeah, phenomenal. Okay, so favorite food. Uh, ooh. Maybe favorite food as of late. Besides 786 pizza. Yeah. Um I don't know. You know, just I guess lately it's just been a like, frequent food. Like maybe. steak, like American, steak. like oh, filet mignon. That sounds you know, nice. just no frills, just right there. Done. I love it. You know, just cooked to perfection, nothing fancy. Awesome. When you fly across the, when you fly mm. across the pond, yep. you have to go on those long flights. What do you do on the flight? Uh, usually I watch movies. I love that. So I do the same. I'm always doing research. Yeah. Uh, for what I do, I have to kind of try to know what trends are. So mm -hmm. um, when I'm on the flights, it gives me a chance to, I mean, when you're on those flights, there you end you up go. watching three movies in a row. So yeah. you can kind of see, like, I'll pick a genre of film. Like, okay, well, you know, on, on this leg of the flight uh, or on this leg of the yeah. trip, I'm going to just do dramatic films and films that I may never really want to pay to see right but they're all free but so I'm just gonna the, the, the yeah, soundtracks you're listening in your to brain, it, yeah. yeah you know and That's I'm great. always watching TV I'm always you know listening you know trying to find going to movies I pay attention to the trailers a lot That's there's right. a lot of money in movie trailers and so right. I actually pay attention to the trailers sometimes more than I do the movie there you go, there <laughs> but, you go. so yeah that's I usually nice. end up watching movies I love that dream collaboration artist musician whatever uh it'd just be more of the same i mean i've gotten to work with You've a lot of my so idols many. yeah you know um there's so many great guys that i've, I've worked with uh, one of the things i'd love to be able to do is go back to uh london again and record more there uh we didn't get to talk about it but um megatrack sent me to london a few years ago and we did three albums of orchestral music at abbey road studio one um, with a 70 piece orchestra, I'd love to go back to Abbey Road and record in Studio Two, which is the Beatles room. Mm. Uh, we've been talking about doing that, and we, it's been on again, off again. Where it's like, yeah, we're gonna do it, and uh, yeah, no, nah. like the scheduling may not work quite right with some of the musicians we want to use. Uh, right. well, you know, let's put it on hold. Oh, wow. now we're gonna do it. Uh, let's put it on hold. Now we're gonna, uh, yeah, so it keeps wow. kind of flipping back and forth, but uh. I'd love to do stuff like that. Um, that sounds fun. You know, I've got friends in Nashville. I'd love to go uh, to Nashville and work on some albums with them. And yeah. I mean, 
just work on more albums with guys like you and <laughs> Wally and you yeah, know uh, cool. another good friend of mine, Jimmy Haslip. I love oh, working yeah. with him. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm really good friends with uh, Matt and Greg Bissonette, and I oh, uh, love those so guys cool. coming in. It's like, you know, it, I have my dream job. And what's crazy yeah. is the job I do now is exactly what I got my degree in 20 years ago. That's incredible. And that's I, a rarity. I wake up every morning and I get to go into a multi-million dollar studio, which we didn't even really mm -hmm. talk about, but the, the that's studio right. the studio at Megatrex is really big. It's one of like the classic studios. Bruce Hornsby recorded his first two albums mm. there. Like, you know, his big hit records were all recorded in that wow. room. Uh, the police worked in there. Don Henley worked in there. Like all these big artists worked in there. And then it, it is such a cool room. And then in the mid nineties, Megatrex took it over and now it's a private studio just for Megatrex. So, right, right. Um, but you know, I get to walk into this huge, it's like a, you know, uh, 24,000 cubic foot live room. And we have like, uh, I think the square footage of the control room is like 700 feet. I get to walk in there every day and that's my office and I get to make music. It's Brilliant. a dream job. You know, sometimes, you know, you get frustrated with the politics or just mm -hmm. some of the, the extra stuff. Oh, I'm dealing with metadata spreadsheets or I'm dealing with, dealing with financial <laughs> spreadsheets and I have to track the money that we're spending and, uh, right. you know, uh, you know, I'm right. gonna, Oh, I'm going to go over budget, but you know what? That's like it, a dirty word. I would, I would rather wake up and do this every day than anything else. Than anything so. else. Yeah. Because you could do spreadsheets for uh, some company that sells office yeah. furniture. I mean, I worked, that's not fun. <laughs> I worked at a software company for three years before I moved out well, there you go. Uh, to uh, LA. And so, I mean, I know the grind and yeah. it's like, dude, I, w I just, I would much rather be doing this than anything else. So well, that's a blessing. Um, so for, in terms of collaborations or dream, it's like, You're already doing I, it. I've already been able to do them all, you know, Love it. and uh, just do more of them. I know I ask this all the time because I know as musicians, a lot of times we don't have hobbies. How do you spend your free time? It's kind of funny. It's probably not really politically correct um, <laughs> to say here, but um, uh -oh. I, for a long time, my hobby was music and my career was music. Right. And so I would just, I would literally spend 16 to 20 hours a day just working. And um, I just recently went through a divorce. Mm. And so I said to myself, I need to find some hobbies that are outside of work. That's right. Because in our profession, we sit in a dark room by ourselves most of the time. It's at least sound engineers, no, you know, and, and, and producers, and we're and editing music all by ourselves, and it's it. very isolating. Yeah. So um, I started uh, exercising. So uh, weightlifting Excellent. is a hobby of mine. Excellent. Uh, I started hiking. That's a hobby of mine. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that I've actually been really getting into recently, which here in California, like in other states, they're like, yeah, but here in California, everybody's like, oh my God, uh, I've been getting into uh, competitive marksmanship shooting. So uh, uh, handgun, rifle, uh, shotgun a little bit, but I, I really like shooting rifles and handguns and trying to do it competitively. So I've been doing like amateur well, competitions. that's cool, but that's a sport. Yeah. You know, it's an actual sport. Yeah. So, that's cool, man. Yeah, so it's fun. And that's a nice, yeah. well-rounded uh, yeah. list of activities there. Yeah, and then Very cool. the next thing I want to start trying to do is like something like a martial art, like jujitsu or something like that. But nice. um, we'll see. We'll see if I can get to that. Nice. All right. Cook, take out, or go out? Uh, go out. Go out. I, I kind of figured that with you. Mm -hmm. And you know a lot of good spots around town. That's because so. I always go out to we, eat. <laughs> we have to go to another one. I can't wait. Libation of choice. Do you have a favorite cocktail, favorite beer, favorite wine? Uh, I don't drink anymore just because okay. as I get older, it's yeah. just like... It's probably uh, smart. It's rough on my body. Yeah. And trying to lift weights and everything. But uh, yeah. when I did, uh, my favorite beer was probably Guinness. Mm. Or actually, uh, I I like Sam, uh, Sam Smith, their stout. Even though I'm Irish and I'll oh. probably <laughs> catch hell for this. Uh, right. I actually liked the English stout better than the Irish stout. Oh, um, wow. But, uh, but yeah, that would probably be... When I drink, when I used to drink uh, hard alcohol, it was always like the fruity, girly drinks because, oh, okay. you know, I never really liked the taste of alcohol, yeah. so I would drink something that I, you know, I've got a sugar tooth, so it would always be like the oh, sweet. It would always be the sweet drinks, but... My, that's my wife. She likes all the sweet drinks. Yeah. I like the straight whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, see, everybody eats I could, their own. I could never do straight yeah. whiskey when I, was, <laughs> when I was drinking. I would always drink the frou-frou drinks. That's awesome. Well, hey... Wrapping it up. Yep. If you weren't a career musician, as I put it, but if you think about it, we're all, we do this as a mm -hmm. living, we're career musicians. What would you do if you weren't doing this? I don't know. You know, it's a tough one. I've thought about that a lot before I decided 
uh, when I was 15, I kind of really made the switch to go into music as a career. Mm. Um, I started playing music when I was 11. And when I was 15, I got my first paying gig. And uh, I played uh, the Man of La Mancha musical. And uh, uh. this is back in like the late 80s, early 90s, when minimum wage in Massachusetts was three eighty-five an hour, $3.85 an hour. I was making $25 an hour as a 15-year-old. And uh, Whoa. yeah, so all my Impressive. friends, yeah, and I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe there is something to this music yeah. thing. You know, maybe I should do it because I knew how to read, and I, you know, I was playing in high school orchestra and everything. And uh, and um, you know, somebody just asked me if I could play percussion, if I knew how to read percussion parts and stuff. And I was sure. like, yeah. And so I did like a local community theater version of Man La Mancha, and. Uh, Made a lot of money off of it. They were paying for rehearsals. I'm so like, you guys the- pay for rehearsals too? Wow. What? Right. You're in the pit? Yeah, I was in yeah. the pit yeah, down in front. And wow. um, and it was me. And then there was a drummer who uh, was a student at Berkeley at the time. And he was the first guy that said, man, you got to think about going to Berkeley. Go to Berkeley. And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't know if I could afford it. And he's like, don't worry about it. You just got to go. You'll figure out a way to to, to to make it happen. And that's ultimately what I ended up doing. That's what you did. But, um, but yeah, so I don't know. I mean, before that, weirdly enough, I was really into uh, the military. I wanted to fly jets and wow. I wanted to be a pilot. And the easiest or cheapest way to become a pilot was to go into the military. And I could so, see you doing that because you're so technically oriented. Yeah. You know? You're very good with that. Yeah. So wow. I, before I really started to focus on music, my plan was to go into the Marine Corps because if you go to the Air Force to fly jets, everybody goes to the Air Force to fly jets. And oh. so very few people actually make it to the point where you can fly jets. Really? Um, the Army doesn't have jets. They only have helicopters. Mm-hmm. But the Marine Corps has jets. But a lot of people that go into the Marine Corps don't necessarily go into the Marine Corps to fly. They're going in to be infantry or mm. be you know logistics or whatever. And so uh, you have a better chance or you had a better chance of actually making it to flight school and becoming a jet pilot. Like in the air force, you can go in and become a pilot, but then you end up flying like, you know, propeller planes and stuff like you don't get to actually fly the jets. So, um, you know, I, that's why I was like, okay, if I go into the Marine Corps and I, you know, make it into flight school, there is a very, very high probability that I'll get to fly like fighter jets and, that's cool. and have the cool, you know, have the cool job. Right. right so, right. um, you know, I really wanted to do that. And then, um, you know, as music took over and I was growing my hair long and <laughs> playing in bands. And then all of a sudden I started to massive. make crazy at the time, crazy money yeah. for a 15 year old. And, right. <laughs> and that that musical led to two other musicals, which, you know, so all of a sudden now, uh, you know, I'm, you know, 16 years old and I've got gigs. I, I was actually getting my high school band director gigs because wow. I was just getting so many gigs. That's why I was like, well, you know what, maybe I should do this whole you know, live musician playing thing. But right. then the sound engineering thing just kept calling me and calling me and I kept pushing it off and saying, no, 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 mm. but I really want to play. Oh, but we need somebody to record. I'm like, okay, I'll record, but I really want to, you know. Yeah. And finally I just embraced it and said, you know what, this seems like this is my calling. Uh, everybody is calling me to record, but not everybody is calling me to play. So, and I love, I just love being a part of the creative process. Like you said, you have your dream job. So yeah. that's, that's quite amazing. So, and I just, I love to create music. I love being in the studio. Right. Um, and I just love to be a part of the creative process and help with the creative process and, and, you know, make music that people can listen to. It's a lot that's of fun. That's incredible. Derek. You've been an amazing guest. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate I, it. I appreciate having me here. It's it's an yeah. honor to be be here with you and be on your podcast. Well, the goal of the Career Musician Podcast is to provide valuable insight aimed at supporting working musicians. Help us continue to provide you with new and engaging content by getting our ratings up. Please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. One man back.
I'll be back this way sometime until then, baby. Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.